We're continuing in this uh, long series. It's about a three-month series uh, on the implications of holiness. Uh, the idea, of course, being that if God is holy, it has certain implications uh, for things that we generally believe flow from us rather than flowing from him. And among those things that flow from God is love. And so today is the third part. This is the part where we talk about the endurance of God's love. I invite you to turn with me to First, or, yeah, First Corinthians and chapter 13. First Corinthians chapter 13. And we're starting up at verse 8 and going down through verse 13. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away the things of childhood. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, uh, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, and then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. I want to put a, a note on the interpretation here. Uh, it should say not mirror, but a dark glass or glass darkly is how the uh, King James puts it. Um, I think that that's extremely important because uh, the idea that, the, that Paul is trying to give us is the idea that we are looking through a smoky glass. Not that we are looking at our reflection, but that we are looking through a glass, like if you've ever looked through a dirty window or if you've ever looked through uh, a window where there's been, uh, a, oh, a, say, a, a wood stove inside of the house and it's gotten soot all over the window. That's the idea that Paul is driving at, not the idea of seeing your reflection in a mirror. That's not at all. And so the translators have kind of dropped the ball on this. And again, you will note that, yeah, I do have some some critical things to say about the modern NIV. Um, that's only because it's deviating from, from the word for word and from dynamic equivalents both, which are incredibly important translating uh, principles that a person has to follow. And uh, whenever they deviate, I call them on it. So I'm calling them on it today. Okay? Very important. Okay, well, we, the, the scripture starts out with a statement that absolutely should have just made you feel awful. I mean, if you're taking God's word seriously, love never fails. Well, then if the love that comes from me is love, <laughs> then something's wrong. Either God's word got it wrong or else I don't know how to love. Because there have been times that even though I love other people or even though I've cared about other people, they have gotten on my serious nerves. And I have failed to love them. Mm -hmm. I've had people that used to be friends that are not friends anymore. Why? Not because, not because I stopped liking them or I stopped appreciating them, but because the love between us, it, it, just, it eventually just did not work. Uh, either they needed me too much, which has been some cases. In other cases, it has just been simply that I just got tired of being treated ba badly, and so I've walked away from some friendships in my past. You have too. Your love failed, my love failed, but it says love never fails. And here we have this scripture, this 1 Corinthians 13. It's read at every at just about every wedding I've ever been to, somebody pulls this out of their hat and says to the bride and the groom, this is the kind of love you guys are supposed to have for each other. 
And the bride and groom find out within three months of marriage that there's no way that they're ever going to be able to match up to 1 Corinthians 13. Somewhere in between the fighting and uh, in between the struggles of trying to get a life started together as a married couple, they find that they don't have love that never fails. But God does. His love never fails. You see, Paul is writing to the, to the Corinthian church because they are obsessed with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And because they're so obsessed with it, he's trying to bring them back away from that and to the basics, to the truth of the Scripture. And the truth of the Scripture is that prophecies are going to be answered and fulfilled and they're no longer going to be in force or necessary. Tongues at some point are going to be stilled. And he goes through these gifts, knowledge, it's going to cease. And he goes through all of these gifts that they think are so important. And he says all of that is going to come to an end. But love is going to endure beyond all of these things. The things that you're obsessed with, the things that you think are so important, they're all going to come to a gradual end. But the love of God cannot fail. It's not that, it, it's not that God has determined that he will not fail in love. It is that love cannot fail because love is eternal as God is eternal. Remember, this is our implication that we're working off of right now. If God is love and God is holy, we don't know what love is without him. I want to bring up three points that will help us to kind of bring this whole sermon, three-part sermon on love, and maybe distill it into a singular thought. These are the qualities of love. First of all, love is holy because God is love and God is holy. So love is holy. And what does holy mean? It means it's cut away from and separated from the human race. That means that if we are going to talk about love in the same context that God talks about love, then we cannot compare it to the love that you share with your friends or with your loved ones on this earth. We can't compare it to that because that's not love the way that God contextualizes it. You see, God's love is eternal, steady state. It always is. There are no shadows of love with God. No degrees of love with God. And so since there are no degrees, one might say he's, he either loves you or he hates you. And you say, wait a minute, I didn't think God hates. And again, we talked about this. If God loves, he has to hate because he has to hate that which violates what he loves. Right? You have your kids, you have your pets, if somebody came and beat up one of your children, would you not hate that person for what he did? Of course. And you might say, oh, no, no, no. I'm going to forgive him because God forgives everybody. Really? Seriously? Your child is beaten to a bloody pulp and you're going to sit there and just turn the eye? Of course you're not. You're going to struggle with those feelings. You may have to process through those feelings. You may make a conscious decision to actively forgive and yet in your heart you are still not going to have forgiven because you hate that which violates what you love and when god hates his hate is righteous it is as righteous as his love and he hates those who do iniquity why because it violates what he loves it's that simple. And you cannot, you cannot make up a God in your head who is so loving that he doesn't have any anger at all for what is bad. 
That's just craziness. That's not even real. And the reality is that God does love. And he loves so eternally and he loves so powerfully that he also hates eternally and hates powerfully that which violates what he loves. Love is perfect because God is love and God is perfect. That means that whatever it is you're calling love with all of its imperfections is actually not love as God defines love. Okay? So far, so good, right? We understand that we're not holy. We understand that we're not perfect, yet we claim to be able to love each other. Do you see how the implication of love, that if God is love and God is holy, we do not know what love is without God. Do you see how that's coming into play and how the scripture is trying to explain that to us? That until we are converted, we have never even tasted of love the way God defines love. And as long as all we are is religious, then we are missing out on the greatest gift of Christianity that there ever will be. And that is actual, genuine love versus all of the pale imitations that you and I have come up with. The third statement, love endures because God is love and God endures. Now here, when I say God endures, I mean that God is eternal. God will not stop. He will not be satisfied until those that he has determined to save save are saved. And to that degree, I am a predestinarian. To that degree but I am not a predestinarian to the degree that this is all just fatalism and all you and I are doing is just living out uh, the inevitable existence of our life that uh, if God has determined before we were born that we were going to go to heaven, that they were going to go to heaven no matter what. Okay, I do believe, I do believe that God knows who is going to be saved but I do not believe that we know who is going to be saved. And I don't think that it can be determined by a series of fortunate or unfortunate events in our lives that, oh, I found out that I'm going to go to hell no matter what. That's not true. And you're not going to go to heaven no matter what. That's not true. Okay, God's foreknowledge does not negate our ability to make our own choice. Does that make sense? To give you an illustration, let's say you're standing on the road. You're walking down the road. It's busy traffic. And you see a cat. And the cat is crouched at the side of the road like it's about to pounce or run. You see a car coming. You see the cat there. You know what's going to happen. That cat's going to run out in front of traffic. It's going to get hit by a car, and it's going to die. And you can run at the cat and say, no! And you can, t- can jump out in front of the traffic and try to, try to stop the traffic so that the cat doesn't get hurt. But ultimately, you don't have time. The cat's too fast. Its decision-making ability is too quick. And that cat's going to die. You foreknew what was going to happen, but the cat still made his own decision. It's the same thing. God knows whether or not you will accept him, whether or not you will call out on his name to be saved. He knows that. But he still calls out on you and tells you clearly, you need to be converted 
you need to be saved. And a false gospel that goes out that determines to different people that they can make their own decision based upon information is not the gospel at all. It is just simply kind of a get out of jail, get out of hell free card that we're playing and people are buying into it. It just cannot happen. God has to do the converting work. So the dark glass I was talking about earlier. We can conceive of love, but never know it truly. In other words, we're looking through this smoky glass at God's love, at the description of God's love that we have here in the Scripture. We're looking through this smoky glass, and we can see His love at work. We can see what His love does, and yet we don't know it innately. In other words, it's not in us, in our flesh, And so if we are ever going to know that love, it's going to be God putting that love and sending it through us. It is not going to be us taking a look and clearly seeing, clearly understanding, clearly knowing what love is, and then implementing it. It will always be us trying our best to imitate what we hardly understand. Now, in that respect, you can't hold yourself guilty for what you, you can't understand. But, in the, but also in the same respect, you cannot be satisfied with a cheap imitation of God's perfect love. You can't be. You must desire to be greatly associated with God, so that his love might be present in your life. We can see love at work, but only when God alone works. The love of God is demonstrated in the Scripture. Throughout the Old Testament, it's demonstrated. We see incredible love from God in spite of the fact that the children of Israel, whom he chose because of his great love to save, we see the children of Israel, and they are constantly sinning against God. And God is constantly forbearant of them. That means he's gracious towards them. That means he's patient with them. That means he understands that they don't understand. And so he is trying to be patient with them until they get to a point at which they do something that he has to punish. And the very ones that he loves, he disciplines. Even some of them disciplines them to death. Because they have so violated that which he loves that in his great anger, he kills them. Take a look at the Old Testament. Read through it. You have the same God in the new that you have in the old. If you can't deal with God as he is, then you have a false God that you've made up in your head. Last of all, we can participate in love through obedience to God. It's actually possible to experience this love and participate in it And I direct your attention to 2 John chapter 1 and verse 6, which there's only one chapter, mind you. I could have just easily said verse 6. And this is love that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. So... We have a command on us that we should walk in love. Yet we can't love without God. And therefore, the only way for us to walk in love is to obey God's commands. So we have a little bit of a circle here. And the circle is God commands us to love. 
and yet we cannot love without obeying God's command. So we cannot obey God's command in a moment and love. We have to continually obey his commands in order for his love to be in our lives. And we can participate in that love. We can bring that love to others. We can bring that love to, uh, you know, to people who don't even know God because we're participating in it through our obedience. And our obedience then brings to life, if you will, examples of God's love in you. And you become the example of his love. And then people, of course, they always get it confused. They think you have some great love. (laughs) You don't have great love. You don't own God's love. It flows through you, but you don't own it. And it's important. And you'll see see in the book of Acts a couple of occasions where Paul had to tell people, look, I'm not a God. Look, you know, I'm just a man. Okay? So don't think that this incredible love or this incredible power comes from me. It doesn't. It comes from Jesus. And they're very specific about that. The endurance factor looks like this. God going through hell to pull us through to glory. Now, I put hell in parentheses. The reason is because he did not go through the actual hell. I am saying, you know, when you and I might go through something horrible, we might say, oh, that was hell on earth. Okay? That's what I mean by this usage of the term. That's why I have uh, the uh, quotation marks around it. Okay? But God went through hell to pull us to glory. Look at what it says in uh, Hebrews chapter 12 and verses 1 to 3. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles us, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, or author and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart." God's love endures. It endured the cross. Could you endure the cross for your loved ones? Oh, maybe in a in a rush of emotion you could. But Jesus was not suddenly taken from humanity, suddenly thrust upon the cross. Where he, where he had very little time to think about it, ponder it, he was aware of the cross from, the, from before his birth. He was aware of the cross throughout his childhood. He was aware of the cross throughout his ministry. He was rejected by the people that he came to save. They tried to kill him in his own hometown. There was none occasion for Christ to ever say that he was truly loved even by his disciples. For on the night that he was betrayed by one of those disciples, the other 11 scattered. Eventually two of them trailed him, yes, but one of those two that trailed him denied him three times. It could not be said that in terms of love as God presents it in 1 Corinthians 13 through Paul, it could not be said that even his disciples truly loved him. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. Could you endure a lifetime of rejection, a lifetime uh, in the shadow of the cross, 
Could you endure the realization that everything that you loved, all of the creation that you made, it would be as if you gave birth to children knowing that someday your wife and your children themselves would betray you and intentionally hang you on a cross. This is the kind of depth of rejection that Jesus faced for you because God's love endures all things. I don't think that we can claim to be anything better than poor actors where it comes to the love that God speaks of. And we may redefine love in order to make it fit our lifestyles, but God will not do that and refuses to. Being a servant to keep God's will unalloyed now, unalloyed, what does that mean? An alloy is two different kinds of metal bonded together. Steel is an alloy. Now, in some cases, of course, steel actually makes iron stronger. But in the case of anything alloyed to God's perfect love, it will weaken it. Philippians 2, verses 1 through 8 We read, therefore, if you have any courage, any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one of mind, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit rather in humility value others above yourselves not looking to your own interests but to each of but each of you to the interests of others in your relationships with one another have the same mindset as christ jesus who being in the very nature god did not consider equality with god something to be attained but rather made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness and being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. God's love endures being a servant. God who had all glory, Christ who stepped down from his glory to be the servant of the Father calls upon you to do likewise and to be his servant now. He served God the Father. He wants his church to serve him. Sometimes we are good servants. Sometimes we are poor servants. But God desires you to be his servant through Christ, in Christ. This love of God is so far beyond human capability. But God deliberately keeps it from us because anything that violates his love, he hates. We cannot be in the presence of a holy God who has holy, perfect love and not expect that we are going to be struck dead because we are the very embodiment, apart from Christ, we are the very embodiment of what he hates. You need to let that sink in. You may not like that statement, but you need to let it sink in. 
Otherwise, you are never going to appreciate what Christ did on that cross for you. What he did on that cross was he took away all of your sin. He anointed you with his blood so that when you stand in the presence of God and God sees that blood, he will pass over you on account of Christ and it will never be on your account. You will never be holy enough, righteous enough, good enough, smart enough, loving enough, ever. And so you need to drop the pretense that you are going to be able to earn your way into heaven. You need to drop the pretense that, oh, I'll go to church when I get my act cleaned up. You will never get your act cleaned up. That is why Christ had to die. And this is the message you should bring to all of your friends who say, yeah, I know I ought to go to church, but, you know, I just got so much going on in my life. You need to bring this message to your friends. Without Christ, they are the very embodiment of the thing that God hates. And God's powerful, converting, miraculous healing can heal you of every sin, can heal you of every stain, and can change you from the embodiment of what he hates to the embodiment of what he loves. And that's the power of God unto salvation. Not that you shrugged your shoulders and decided to give in and decided to do a righteousness that you don't like anyways and give up everything you love but that you should repent and that you should now love everything you used to hate, the righteousness that you used to hate. And you should now hate the sin that you used to love. That is repentance. And that is a gift of God itself. If you are not saved and if there are people that you care about that you want to be saved, plead with God for their conversion. Do not do not leave it to them to just wander around and figure it out on their own. Speak up. Say something. Do something. If you cannot convert a soul with your words or with your emotions, then pray to the God who can. Let's pray. Father, this gospel is wondrous beyond understanding that you could convert us merely by the application of the blood of Christ and yet that is real conversion for it changes us, gives us a new nature, a nature of love. God, I pray in Jesus' name that you would instill this in our hearts fully, that Lord, we would be changed by your gospel, not just challenged by it, in your son's name we pray. Amen.